There's been a lot of uh, people have mentioned that uh, Alzheimer's, they call it type three diabetes. I don't know if that's accurate or they're just trying to be using that expression, but the implication is that you <clears throat> treat Alzheimer's prevention the way you would diabetes and not let your blood sugar get too high. So the three part question is one, what is the ideal diet for preventing Alzheimer's? And I don't know if there is one for Parkinson's. Number two, does the ideal diet include whole food plant-based fats, meaning raw seeds, raw nuts, avocados, raw olives, and even possibly oils like hemp, flax, and chia? And then part three is where does fruit fit into this? They got a whole bunch of whole food plant-based people saying fruit is great. And then you have Brian Clement and Hippocrates saying, look, I've been looking at blood under the microscope for 20 years and fruit is feeding yeast mold, fungus and cancers. And therefore, if you're fighting diabetes or Alzheimer's, you don't want sugar, which means you don't want fruit. And that's not what most people are saying. So it's what's the diet is whole, is whole food fat, seeds, nuts, avocados, olives, okay. And what about fruit? And we're talking about how to prevent Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's. That's the question. I'd love to jump in on this one, if you don't mind. Uh, as far as fruit goes, when you look at glycemic load, and it's unfortunate that many doctors are still using glycemic index, which is extremely inaccurate. But when you look at glycemic load, uh, I know that Brian Clement doesn't want blood sugars to go too high, but we also don't want them to go too low. Blood sugar should be maintained somewhere in the range of 70 to 90 milligrams per deciliter. This is the optimum range. So if you eat whole fruit, not fruit juice, not dried fruit, but whole fruit, and if its glycemic load isn't too high, most fruits are in there. Apples, pears, berries, these are all in the low glycemic load range they will slowly absorb and keep your blood sugar at the optimal level without exceeding the amount if, of course, you don't have insulin resistance to the point that people with diabetes already do. As far as the fats and oils in whole intact foods, you mentioned avocados, great. Nuts and seeds, great. The only nut that I would not recommend would be coconut uh, because of the lack of vitamin E and the excesses of saturated fats. But otherwise, these whole fats are great I do not encourage extracted fats like oils uh, instead of chia oil or something. Uh, ground flaxseed are a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. They're very helpful. And what was the first part? <laughs> uh, fruit fat and what's the overall diet you're recommending? Well, for prevention of Alzheimer's disease, you would want to have a diet that supplies all of your essential nutrients, vitamins and minerals, as well as the correct amount of fats, but not just the correct amount of fats, but the correct fats. Humans only need two essential fatty acids, linoleic, the omega-6, and alpha-linolenic, the omega-3. Other than that, adult humans have no requirement for saturated fat or EPA or DHA or any other fat. And as far as EPA or DHA goes, well, they can improve our cardiovascular risk, but they may also increase our cancer risk because of pollutants and rancidity. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. So algal oil would be a better choice. In my book, Fats and Oils Demystified, I have a whole chapter on how we can convert the plant-based omega-3 into EPA and DHA. So the, I would say the, the best diet is going to be a whole food plant diet, but carefully chosen. So each of the nutrients is present and I do think that normally diets need to be supplemented for several reasons, and mostly because I analyze diets and I see that each diet I analyze may be deficient in, say, zinc, but zinc is necessary for superoxide dismutase to protect our brains. And that, that is true for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. If we don't have copper or manganese or selenium, we can't, our endogenous antioxidants don't work, superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase. So we may need to take some supplements along with this whole plant diet in order to get everything we need to keep our brain sharp, especially folate and vitamin B12. Those are crucial for creating s methionine, known as SAMe, which methylates or quenches those very genes that create the secretase enzyme so that they don't create them. It's epigenetically stopping this. 
I, I don't want to talk too long. You can tell I'm enthusiastic, but it's a great <laughs> question. Well, and this is your area of expertise, which is fantastic to have here. Let me just ask if I could one question while we have you here. So uh, as you know, Rick Johnson has uh, put out a lot of very interesting work on uric acid and relationship of fructose to uric acid. And his argument is that a potentially important contributor to Alzheimer's may be fructose because of the way it's metabolized, because of this reduction in mitochondrial function, reduction in ATP. Do you think it is, for, now of course you've pointed out the really exciting part about, yes, you get all this wonderful fiber as well. And of course, all sorts of phytonutrients as well. But what about, you know, is this an area, is this a concern if you've got people who are taking too much fructose in terms of their potential for cognitive decline? Well, yes and no. Yes, if it's high fructose corn syrup in a drink and they're guzzling tons of it, and definitely yeah. no if they're eating a piece of whole intact organic fruit. This is a, really a big difference. So yeah. we can do that, we can handle that. Now you mentioned uric acid, and I think it's very interesting that uric acid, we all think of gout, right, when we say yeah. uric acid. Yes. Did you know that uric acid is a very important antioxidant in our systems? Absolutely. And it helps to protect our brain and all of our, our bodies. One of the reasons why dairy products are so damaging with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease is that dairy products suppress uric acid in the body. So we're losing one of our important antioxidants. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, and of course, Bruce Ames showed years ago that if you look at the loss of antioxidants in the blood as you now start to insult, uric acid is one of the first ones to disappear. So it's one of the first ones used up and therefore likely to be a critical one, as Bruce showed you know, many, many years ago. So I absolutely agree. And so it's interesting to me, there's this paradox with uric acid where it's on the one hand a protectant, and of course, people with gout had on average higher IQs that was supposed to be attributed to this protective effect, whether that's true or not, don't know. But on the other hand, where his, his argument would be that the way it's metabolized is associated with hypertension, is associated with, you know, with salt, is associated with, uh, you know, with many of the diseases of aging, you know, arthritis, cognitive decline, and things like that. So there is this interesting paradox. And if you just do the epidemiology, of course, people with high uric acid are, have a slight protection from cognitive yeah. decline. That's right. uh, so there's a, there's a real paradox there, I think, in terms of uric acid. And we need people like you who really understand nutrition to understand and to, to explain to us this paradox. Well, it's that the antioxidants all work together. It's all of them, the exogenous antioxidants, you know, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, they work together with our internal antioxidant enzymes and uric acid is one of them as, as well as catalase and, um, and ubiquinone too, yeah. uh, coenzyme Q10. All of these work together. And in our Hawaii dementia prevention trial, which I wrote and ran and then wrote the paper in the book, Nutrients for Memory afterwards, this is a randomized controlled trial. And we were able to take people from, well, we, they were 19 on the mini mental state exam, okay, just barely into dementia. Yeah. And within three months, they were up to 27. They dropped wow. in the next three months to 26.5. And in the next, at the end of the nine month trial, they were up to 29 out of 30. Wow. Because we use 16 different interventions, many of which encourage antioxidants. But antioxidants are more of a long-term prevention of Parkinson's disease because they protect, of course, dopaminergic cells too, and, and, and the hippocampus and all the other areas of the brain. More short-term effects are also seen with, with other of our approaches there. Yeah. One, one additional thought on a diet is uh, I get concerned about what's either on what I'm eating or what's in what I'm eating and uh, especially nerve toxins like pesticides. So there's this one pesticide called Paraquat, uh, increases the risk of Parkinson's by 150%, uh, most widely used, one of the most widely used herbicides in the country, uh, 30 countries, including China have banned it, but the US hasn't. You know, it's used on corn, it's used on uh, grapes, it's used on uh, other um, uh, foods that we eat, another pesticide called chlorpyrifos, EPA finally banned it last year, but widely used on Washington state apples. Uh, a study done in France looked at all the French wines that were produced and every single bottle of French wine that they tested, basically the consumer reports of France found that uh, detectable levels of pesticides in every single one of them. Now they, now they were still low, but it's still a little bit concerning that even the organic wines had detectable levels <laughs> of uh, pesticides uh, found in them. 
And then, you know, some of these pesticides get concentrated throughout the food train. Many of them are uh, food chain, many are fat soluble so that when you drink fatty substances that they can have pesticides in them. And you know, as you know, most people know the brain is very fatty so that these fat uh, soluble pesticides could be making our way into the brain. And indeed studies have, have found remnants of these pesticides in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. So wash your fruits and vegetables uh, and buy organic uh, and uh, tell your Congressman and, uh, to sign Senator Cory Booker's uh, bill that would ban uh, paraquat. I wish that it were enough to buy organic and wash your yeah. vegetables, but it's not. Because as you know, the persistent organic pollutants, the organochlorines, the polychlorinated biphenyls, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, DDT and its breakdown product, DDE, these are all lipophilic, fat loving, and they are bioaccumulated, as you just mentioned, in the food chain. And they are bioaccumulated. So if you get a grass fed cow who's eating grass that has never been sprayed organic, that grass has detectable levels of these in it and the cow bioaccumulates them. And then you get a human eating either the milk or the meat of the cow, it bioaccumulates, as you mentioned, in the fattiest area of the body, which is the brain. So that this bioaccumulation occurs in animal fat, but does not occur, of course, in plant fat because they just grow once. And so unfortunately, buying organic is not enough when it comes to animal products. It, it's not helpful enough. I, I wish it were, but definitely buy organic everywhere else. And could you guys weigh in on one other thing? If, if I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize for jumping in here, Steve, but I just would love to hear from the two experts here. One of the things that's come up recently is that a, a toxicologist has written me a few times saying that she is seeing uh, patients who, who are developing either Parkinson's or ALS. And these are people where when she looks at multiple factors, they don't seem to have a lot of things that, that are associated with this. The one thing she finds is very high levels of glyphosate. And of course, others have said uh, glyphosate is relatively non-toxic, don't worry about it. So what's your sense about this? Uh, are, is this uh, statistically or epidemiologically associated with neurodegenerative conditions? Uh, glyphosate is closely associated with certain specific cancers and there have been lawsuits won on this. So we know yeah. that it has some terrible dangers to it. I have not seen research with glyphosate on the brain. Glyphosate is not a, a fat loving, uh, organic pollutant that's uh, persistent. Uh, yeah. Okay, it kind of goes away after you, you use it. But one thing uh, with ALS and Alzheimer's disease that is a, possibly a problem is BMAA. It's beta yeah. methyl L amino, uh, let's see, <laughs> it's a alanine. tough one. <laughs> L alanine, that's it. Yeah. Uh, beta methyl amino L alanine. Uh, BMAA is found in, uh, from algae, certain toxic algae, and it's found in especially bottom crawlers like crabs and shrimp and those things. And people who live near bodies of water like that have higher incidence of both Alzheimer's disease and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So that may be a link for those two people right there, although there are many other toxic links in the world. And uh, Ray Dorsey will be happy to know this one's not man-made. Well, not exactly. <laughs> Some of those algae blooms are man-made. Um, so uh, pesticides have been linked to both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, and it's not all pesticides have been linked. And the list of pesticides is hundreds, thousands. Uh, glyphosate, I'm not sure. Um, I think glyphosate might be just a marker for other pesticides that are being used, and it might be interact. There could be interactions uh, with them. Many of the pesticides that are most linked to Parkinson's uh, target the energy-producing parts of cells called mitochondria. The dopamine producing nerve cells in uh, Parkinson's disease are these gigantic uh, cells that have a million different dendrites and they're basically just big bags of mitochondria. So they're really, really susceptible to uh, toxins that target the energy producing parts of cells of which many of these uh, pesticides are. So certain of these pesticides are linked to Parkinson's, they're linked to ALS. Um, they're found, you know, they're found on turf. So, you know, football players might be getting Parkinson's disease from uh, getting head trauma, the baby, they also might be getting Parkinson's disease and ALS from the pesticides that are on the fields in which they've been playing for the last 30 years. Um, Dr. Bredesen, just to go back to the diet question, um, in terms of fruit and in terms of beans and grains, all three of them can affect your blood sugar. Um, are you concerned when it comes to Alzheimer's prevention, if you're trying to keep your blood sugar down, 
Are you concerned that those foods, those healthy whole food plant-based foods in some way raise blood sugar to a point that would concern you or is yeah. that? It's a well, great point. And we haven't yeah. really talked about CGM yet. We haven't talked about uh, continuous glucose monitoring, which I think is turning out to be very, very helpful because you can not only look at the spikes that people are getting when they're eating various things like, you know, they're eating you know, healthy oatmeal, things like that. Um, they're also, it's also showing that they're dropping into troughs. And we have people all the time who are finding out, oh my gosh, you know, I, I woke up at 3 a.m. with a glucose of 45. So I do think that CGM is changing the way we think about this. And you're right, again, comes back to what Steve was saying earlier. You know, you really have to kind of go person by person. This is a thing where it depends on who you are, what you're doing. Some people do very well uh, with legumes and thing, things, beans and things like that. Other people uh, can have uh, autoimmune related issues as uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry has reported. Uh, and, but, but again, some, for some people it's excellent and it's part of a, uh, you know, of a low uh, meat or non-meat uh, diet. Uh, and certainly Dean Ornish has written a lot about uh, these sorts of diets. So again, I think it depends on the person. Some people do much better. In general, we stay away from grains, dairy, simple carbs, just because those are all associated uh, with, uh, with an increased risk for cognitive decline. Well, I do look at grains a little bit more finely, and there are some grains such as quinoa uh, at, that are very slowly absorbed. And I'm not concerned about so much a spike in blood sugar. I want blood sugar to be in the good range. As you mentioned, we don't want it too low. We don't right. want it too high. We want it to say 70 to 90, that's perfect. So our brains can function. We can take our, our neuropsychological tests and come out fine and we can keep that going. And it, it is a cause of concern for brain cell death, whether dopaminergic or in the hippocampus, that we don't have enough sugar and you can actually initiate excitotoxicity, which is relevant both for epilepsy and migraines. A little off topic for this. We do look at beans as far as their glycemic load go extremely slow so that as your body's utilizing glucose all the time from your blood and the beans slowly put glucose into your blood, it's at a point where your body doesn't need to insert insulin or glucagon at all. It's being maintained just fine with the beans themselves. And for diabetics, beans are perfect because they never create a spike in blood sugar. No matter how you process them, they don't. Grains, of course, is harder because most grains are real junk. When, when you take wheat and you make it into white flour, you're removing 86% of the manganese. That's a, magnesium, excuse me. That's a really important nutrient. And you're also stripping other minerals, vitamin E and other things out of these white rice and white. Did you know that how the first vitamin was discovered? Thiamine was discovered when they first polished rice in Japan. No one ever had a deficiency until they polished rice. They didn't know it existed. So it's, it's not that all carbs are bad. For instance, uh, purple sweet potatoes have a nice slow absorption. They're very healthy. They have anthocyanins, they're really good food. There are some people who can't handle them. And then as far as wheat goes, we have gliadin, which can be actually neuroactive. Uh, with autistic kids, some of them, if you take away the wheat, they become much less autistic and their behavior becomes much better. So it, that can be a problem. And I certainly agree with you that uh, dairy is not an acceptable food for the brain. And uh, I know that Dr. Dorsey has looked at heptachlor in dairy products and many other organochlorines are concentrated bioaccumulated in milk, even organic milk. And that these are very toxic, especially to those very sensitive dopaminergic cells, but also our other brain cells create a uh, higher risk of cancer. And are just, and, and they reduce uric acid, as as we mentioned before. There's many reasons not to eat dairy products, but we need do need to keep our calcium up. So there, the nuts and the beans are going to improve our calcium in our diet. So they have a place there. <laughs>